right, everyone. Thank you for joining here. Uh, we're gonna get going in just a minute or two, wait for everyone else to, to join. Um, but uh, meanwhile, the chat is open here and uh, you should be able to chat amongst yourselves and us uh, and let us know where you all joining from. For example, uh, myself, uh, my name is Denny Lee, and I'm actually from the Seattle, Washington area. So where are you guys from? Love to see it in the panel on the chat here. And I'm, uh, and I'm Douglas Moore. I'm outside of the Boston area. And it's quite warm here today. And this is your host, Ryan Boyd, and I am uh, in Burlingame, California right now and preparing for a move over to Boulder. Woo, Boulder. Um, All right. We've got some people from Austria, New York City, Poland. Oh, that's awesome from Poland. Uh, we're, we're in Poland out of curiosity. Uh, and then San Diego. I love that town. That's pretty awesome. Uh, London, India, uh, Jaipur, Squaw Valley, Netherlands. Hey, that's awesome. Cool. So good to see everybody jumping on board. This is awesome. Ah, Warsaw. Excellent. I've actually really loved my visits to Warsaw. I've done talks there a couple of times and it's a very uh, enthusiastic audience, which is great. Awesome. Let's hope we can get this COVID-19 thing figured out so that way we can start doing that again. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope. Let's yeah. Hope. All right. Um, I think we should be ready to get going now. The, the pace of people joining has slowed a little bit. So um, we're here today, everyone, to talk about Slowly Changing Dimensions, uh, SCD Type 2, uh, which is a fundamental from the data warehousing world. Uh, and we're here to talk about how that applies in data lakes, uh, and in particular, Delta Lake. Uh, so again, my name is Ryan Boyd. I'm your host today, substituting for Karen, filling in some big shoes here for those of you who have attended past uh, meetups, but uh, really looking forward to this and talking with Douglas and Denny. So as a reminder, um, the upcoming online events are available on our meetup uh, site. So the Data AI Online Meetup. And you can also subscribe to uh, our YouTube channel where we're launching a lot of new live content plus pre-recorded content. Uh, and be sure to turn on your notifications in order to get alerted when uh, we have launched a new online, or sorry, new live or uh, recorded video. Um, and just a side note there is we're almost at 30,000 subscribers on YouTube, uh, just a few more subscribers to go. So uh, please join and push us over that line. Uh, and if you enjoy the content here, um, I am sure you will enjoy the Spark Plus AI Summit that is coming up here in just a couple weeks or a few weeks. Uh, and uh, so that's June 22nd to 26th. Um, and both Douglas and Denny uh, will be presenting during the summit uh, on a variety of different topics, but we have a few hundred other sessions uh, full five days, full week of, of content. We have quadrupled the pre-conference training, and here is a discount code uh, for you to get 25% off the training. The conference itself is free, um, so you only really have to pay if you want to go to the training, or there's a special VIP pass, which gives you uh, some special access and uh, different types of content as well. Uh, but even that is only, I believe, $99. So uh, register today and uh, we'll have some great sessions as well as some keynotes on our upcoming products from Databricks, but also a lot of things from the open source community, academic community, um, and uh, some, some great thought leaders uh, that are going to be keynoting. So for today, however, uh, I wanted to introduce you to the two people speaking here. So uh, Douglas Moore, uh, Solutions Architect here at Databricks. And uh, I, I, I chose a very quick summary of his bio, came for data vis visualization and stayed for computation and data. Uh, Douglas, do you wanna just introduce yourself quickly? Yeah, hi everyone. 
Uh, I'm, I'm Douglas Moore. I've been uh, working at Databricks for uh, just over a year, but I've been in uh, data databases, first uh, OLTP databases, and then uh, more data warehouses, data marts uh, for analytics over the last 20 years or so. And uh, I've been working in big data specifically for about eight years. And I kind of, I kind of smile that that you actually uh, cut, that I actually wrote that that quote in my bio. I, I think <laughs> it's kind of funny. One one of my Spark AI tracks is is a uh, portable data visualization. So uh, hope hope you come and see that as well. Oh, cool! I actually want to go see that. So looking forward to that, Douglas. Uh, great. Well, thank you for the introduction here, Douglas. Um, and then uh, he, Douglas is going to be interviewed and in discussion with Denny, a developer advocate here at Databricks. Um, and I took his past introductions to me, uh, both internally as well as on some of these meetups, to say his parents forced him into pre-med pre -med, and he went into bioinformatics instead, trying to, trying to get a little bit of that technology in there. And then he went full boat uh, against the, the wish of his, his wishes of his parents by going into data warehousing, data science, and eventually developer relations. Uh, Denny, uh, want to introduce yourself a little bit more beyond uh, beyond that line? Uh, thanks very much, Ryan. Uh, that's a little probably sus suspiciously specific, but nevertheless, <laughs> um, well, I've been part of Databricks. Uh, I guess I'm going on about three years with a break in between. Um, that's another long story. Uh, was actually part of the SQL Server team at Microsoft and help at our enterprise customers working with data warehousing and OLTP uh, enterprise projects with SQL Server. And I was also uh, prior to Databricks also uh, on the team that helped build what is now known as HD Insight. We were the nine person uh, incubation team. So I've uh, been working with Apache Spark for quite some time, still likes to intermix data warehousing. And then every so often you'll still see me talk a little bit of on the biological side. So that way I don't disappoint my parents, just as Brian called out. All right. Yeah, we don't want to have you disappointing your parents. No, 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 let's not do that. Yes. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's get into it. Now that you've met everyone, uh, I'm going to turn it over here to Douglas uh, and let Douglas uh, present his screen and he's going to be presenting his notebook here uh, on slowly changing dimensions. So Douglas, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you, Ryan. Uh, let's see. Uh, I assume you can see my notebook now. Yes, we can. We can. Uh, all right, very good. So I just want to set uh, some context initially. So, we, you know, a lot of companies, uh, you know, part of that eight years in, in big data has been about building data lakes. And, and data lakes are a way to bring in all these different data sources and integrate it and prepare it for AI, ML, reporting, uh, creating data products and, and doing stuff downstream. So, so you bring, bring your data in a raw format, whether it's CSV or, or just binaries or, and whatnot, and you clean it up and, and you prepare a goal. A lot of companies are also moving their data warehouses that they may have acquired actually 20 or so data warehouses over their, over their last 40 years or so. And they're bringing all that data in there, a lot, a lot of uh, structured data. And they wanna build another data warehouse in the cloud and, and run that off to the data lake and uh, technologies or, or move that to a cloud data warehouse. And you know what? And 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 I saw this on on premise and Hadoop, and 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 what what you need to do that to support that is you do all the ETL in your data lake because it's cost efficient and scalable, and and then you push it into your data warehouse. So what what you need to do there is you know integrate all these data sources. You need to build your fact tables. You need to build your dimension tables because. You know the the techniques, the Kimball techniques for analyzing dimensional data still live on and will live on for many more uh, years and probably decades uh, to follow. So, doing this in Hadoop was doing building dimensional tables was was really hard because common technique there is a, is for a dimensional table is to build a slowly changing dimension type two. Now, why type two? What happened to type one, you might ask? 
Well, type one is where you overwrite, say that customer record with new information. Type two um, creates a new record with the new attributes of the customer. And, and type two is very important in that it preserves all the facts that you've accumulated up to this point in time. You may be running, uh, you know, and building this data warehouse every, every month or every week, or, you know, as you get more horsepower and more efficiency, you could be rebuilding this or updating it every four hours or so, you know, giving your consumers fresh data. Now, you don't want to rebuild that fact table every time a customer, or device, product, store, so on and so forth changes. So you want to add a new customer record and then any new facts that come in, uh, you know, sales or orders related to that customer, they just get added to and, and linked to that new customer record, that current active customer record. So that's why, you know, you, you do this in the data lake, why you at, use a, a type two uh, dimension here. And then, you know, as you need to, you, you're kind of analyze, you have some users analyzing the data directly off the gold tables, or, you know, you're shipping this uh, for your high concurrency uh, reports and dashboards into your uh, cloud data warehouse. Denny, did you have something? Well, I mean, you, you've talked about type one and type two, which is awesome. But I guess the question for me is like, uh, I believe you had mentioned in the past that like there's actually like six different types of uh, slowly changing dimensions, right? Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's kind of crazy. And, and, and by no, no means I, I, am I going to go into those? But Wikipedia would list six. Kimball would really only list three. Right. And, and so, and, and I would go with Kimball, and he, you know, that's where you're adding additional columns. Like, you know, what was your first address? What was your second address? So, or what was your first market segment or second market segment? No problem. So let, let's dive into that. So you've been bringing up the concept of Kimball. So for the folks that actually have a data warehousing background, they're probably going to understand, invariably understand Kimball quite well. But how about for those folks that are coming more from the distributed side of the plan? What, 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 are, what is in reference to Kimball in this case? Well, uh, so, so Kimball's um, created a methodology for building uh, analytics in a data warehouse. And, and thought through all the unique data problems and how to structure it and all the processes and kind of codified it. And he has hundreds of kind of tips and best practices available now. And he's written a whole, whole bunch of books and has a whole team to support him. And, and so he codified all these techniques and the slowly changing dimension type two is a best practice. And, and the, the key aspect of it is it allows you to do as of analytics. You know, what, what did my sales or orders look like as of last month, last week, three years ago? And, 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 and that's really important. If, if you just use the type one dimension, then you can only do as is view of the world. You know, what does the world look like today? And, Got it. And, and, and that doesn't really let you understand what the world looked like according to all your data, uh, you know, last quarter. So if you want to do quarter over quarter analysis, week over week analysis, it, it's, it's impossible to do. Got and it. So, so Kimball codified all, all this. Now, it, with Hadoop. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, one yeah. the clarification point. Yeah. Is there then an implication on the type of schemas that are being built when you when you work with uh, type two slows and changing dimensions? Yeah, yeah, so uh, good point. Maybe I, I skipped over that context setting. So there's a, a, a dimensional or star schema that you see here. You have the fact table here and you have foreign keys uh, from, from your customer device or product or, or store, so on dimensions there's usually a, a time dimension as well in here. And, and those are surrogate keys, say on the customer table that lend themselves to this fact. And the fact might be generated off of a purchase order or a sales transaction, an e-commerce order, um, so on and so forth. 
So, so these facts, they're, they're generally append only, but, but the, the dimensions that represent a customer, customers change, their preferences change, uh, the market segment that you might want to classify them in that we're going to use for this example will change over time. A device or a product, you might have different revisions of a product that you're selling. You might not want to, or, or device, a, a device might get moved or change ownership or re, reprovision. So these things change over time. You need to capture that history. You don't want to lose that history. Uh, because you want to understand, like, you know, what, why did my, a classic example is, um, why did my, let's say I, I have a, a wine store, I'm selling wines, and I want to understand why uh, my sales have dropped. Well, you know, you can look at the facts all day long, but, you know, without that context that maybe some of your customers have moved out of the region around your store. You know that would be lost if if you use the type one dimension. Now building this in in uh, a data lake with with a you know uh, technology say Hadoop or you know other technologies where your data lake is append only. You know the underlying substrate is S3 or HDFS. You're, you know it's append only file system that gives it the the amazing scale. That, that you get petabytes of data that you can store in your data lake and integrate it all, but you know you can't update it directly because that would require locking. So Delta Lake creates this abstraction over S3 or ADLS Gen 2 over your cloud storage and allows you to get these updates, these deletes, these um, upserts or merges. And so the, that upsert or merge is, is key to doing a, a slowly changing dimension type too, because what you do is you're gonna update the previous record. So in, in this example here, this previous record, you know, the supplier state is California. That previous record, that was given the end date. You know, when, when was a, supplier in this example, when was the supplier last in the state of California? Well, 2004, 12, 22. Prior to that, they were in California. Now, after that date, they're considered to be in Illinois. So they're given a new start date. End date is unknown. So that's null. So this you know, as you can see, this is an additive process, but you have to go back and update that pre exist that, that prior record here. And that's what's been challenging with Hadoop and Big Data is doing updates until Delta Lake comes along. And so now we can do that. Uh, we have updates and, and inserts, but uh, it's important to note that you want to do these two things, add the new record and update the previous one in one transaction because you don't want any kind of inconsistency. And, and Delta Lake gives you transactions and asset compliance on that update. And the merge operator, you know, across each operator, the merge operator allows you to combine both the update and the insert. Uh, so database people know this as upsert. The kind of the Hadoop big data folks know this as a merge. So in and, and, uh, and, uh, and Delta Lake, it's called the merge into operator. And so we're, we're gonna get into that. But before we do that, let's explore the data a bit. So I have some data from a TPC data set, the customer data. I, you know, I drop into a bash, I do an LS, I see it's 117 megabytes, you know, a sample data set. I see it's got 750,000 uh, lines in it. And I can see that it's pipe separated and I see that it has no header to it. So these are important things that, that I need to know when I, it comes to loading the data. So I'm gonna split this cut, you know, for demo purposes only. Normally you could just ingest that one go. And I, I'm gonna use another feature of Delta that we're not gonna get into too much, but it's copy into. Copy into will track like which files you've read and which files you've not read. But what I'm doing is I'm reading 
from the cloud storage, you know, in, in your uh, AWS account or, uh, or Azure Blob Store, but I'm reading from your store, from our storage account, the data, I'm mapping it based on types and names. And I'm putting that into this Delta table here. And I'm, I'm telling the, the copy into that it's a CSV, the separator, it's pipe, infer to schema, no header. I learned this because of my data exploration. And because I run this as a demo, I, I'm going to force this to reload. You know, other, otherwise, what, what copy into will do is ensure that you only load it once. It keeps track of all the files that you've loaded. So, and, and it simplifies your ingestion. But anyways, so for the demo, we're going to force that to true. So that runs. Then I'm going to create a table over it, over that location. Now this is accessible, this customer dim table is now accessible via SQL. So I can work with it in SQL. I can look at, at all the different types of it, fields. I can look at the physical location of where that data is. And I can browse the data and see that I've imported. Now, one thing I didn't talk about, uh, let me go back. You know, if you're an ETL shop, you're going to add a lot of audit columns here. So I, I put this in here because, uh, you know, I used to do this for a living, build ETL systems. But, you know, the input file name, what was the source file? This gives you the provenance, the, the user that ran this job, the job date. If you see my notebook, I added some parameters here, the job date. Um, my username, the, the target direct uh, database there as parameters. So anyways, going back, I'm loading, I'm loading this, sorry. So I, I loaded all that date. I loaded all that date, I have the audit columns here, source, user, create date when I, I created this record and update date. So I, I think I mentioned I designed some data warehouses in the past. So it's hard for me to build a demo without some of these production uh, type uh, things that you would expect. Anyways, let's look at the customer dimension in, in more of a summary point of view. So what I see is we have five market segments in the TPCH data set. And uh, you know, this is a synthetic data set and, and your first clue there is that this is evenly balanced. You wouldn't normally expect to see this in a real data set, but you know, because we clicked here, we could bar chart, you know, we could basically see that we have five segments and, and they're evenly balanced. And so with Delta Lake, you can look at the transaction history and you can see that I did a load. I did this yesterday. And, and, the and the copy operation. And you can scroll over here and you can see a bunch of operational metrics. You know, uh, I, loaded, um, I loaded a bunch of records here. Make sense, any, uh, any questions thus far? So I, I took us through the overview and loading the data and, and a, a little bit of an analyzing the, the data that we loaded. Sure, sure. Actually, we've got some great questions that are coming in. So why don't we take a pause here uh, to start diving into those questions, actually. Uh, but before we even do that, I did want to call out uh, one thing that people may not have noticed that Douglas is doing a great job showing. You notice that this notebook is a SQL notebook, right? So very much in line with how our data warehousing folks are typically running. So uh, on the top of SQL and all the commands are in SQL. Um, up to this point, most of our Delta Lake sessions have actually been on Scala or on Python. But Douglas has done a great, a great call at the fact that, well, yes, for those folks who are very much in that data warehousing database world, uh, a la SQL, there you go. Let's go ahead and build this stuff in SQL. So, so hey, uh, Douglas, we've got some good questions. And in fact, I, I went ahead and answered some of them privately, but I, by the same token, I think it's good for the entire audience. So let's go ahead and start with the first question is, um, uh, can Delta tables generate certain keys, uh, I, uh, like basically identity columns in the SQL world? Uh, and I basically answered like, no, you actually have to automatically create them yourself. But I just figured, you know, since you've done this many times, any other suggestions on how you would approach that particular problem? 
Yeah, Denny, uh, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, that came up yesterday, actually, with a customer. Perfect. And, um, and, and there, there's like three approaches to do that, at least three approaches. And we could devote a whole, uh, actually, session to generating surrogate keys at scale with, with Spark. So, uh, you know, we, we might want to say that, that there's, there's like generating a hash on, on, on the key values. There's a monotonically increasing ID. Um, a lot of people come from, you know, Kimball said this himself, and it was a lot easier in, in smaller systems, but you have just uh, a, a, a sequence number. Now, a sequence number doesn't work too well in a massively parallel system. Right. It doesn't, it doesn't scale. Yeah. So, you know, you got to break it down into partitions and, and do things like that. And, and you got to accept that, you know, sooner or later, your, your, your ID numbers aren't going to be sequential and compacted. So we, we could actually devote a whole session just to this. I, I've gone through this a number of times with, with customers and it, it's a meaty subject. So uh, it's an excellent question. So, so maybe we can uh, set up an item for a future date. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Because that alone, right. That alone, just the idea of parallelization. I, I had some customers in the past try to go ahead and like have a service that would just generate the ID in sequence and compaction. And of course, basically what ended up happening is that the system got throttled <laughs> when they're trying to load yeah, all that much get, data. You, yeah. you, get, you get throttled down to one core. Yeah. You know, that the hash is, is, is super parallel. Yeah. You, you do have to deal with collisions. Exactly. Yeah. The, 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 mm -hmm. Exactly to your point, Douglas, uh, we would literally have one entire system just on hash collisions. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we could. So, cool. Uh, yeah, but uh, I'd, how are we doing on time? Uh, we're doing pretty good. So let's let's ask another question. And there's some mm -hmm. other questions that are coming in the Q&A panel. Let's ask the one more question. I'm going to go ahead and answer them privately while you go ahead and um, continue on. And right. then if we have right. time, We'll do the other ones, but let's at least ask this other question. Uh, a, another great question that I thought was that we should share with everybody is uh, keeping in consideration about time to market, right? Do you still recommend the dimensional modeling that you're designing? And I, I, my response to him was that uh, um, was that um, you could potentially do that. Uh, uh, one approach that some of the customers that I've worked with is basically they would have the, at least when it comes to the medallion model, the bronze and silver tables are not dimensional modeling and the gold tables are. So because the gold tables would end up being where you apply the dimensional model, but you didn't necessarily apply it to bronze and silver. So that way you can actually have faster time to market. But I'm just wondering if you can, but is that the right approach or is, yeah, can you potentially that, add that, to it? Yeah. That's, that's definitely my, been my experience as well. That, that, you know, and it's not like all your data actually meets, makes it to the gold layer. Right. You know, we draw this, this diagram, but, you know, the bronze layer should probably be 10 times larger than the <laughs> silver layer. And, and that's multiples larger than what's in the gold layer. If all right, we'll, 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 fix, we'll fix the diagram. Then. <laughs> you know, but we, we draw these kind of nice and even because it shows better. Yes. But, you know, what, what, what companies do is they land the raw data because you don't want storm filtering because they might drop something you might need today or you might need in three months from now. So, you, 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 you know, you have the, the theme, touch it, take it. You know, if, if you touch a system, we'll bring it all in. You know, you keep the, the catalog and the provenance of that, but then you allow people, power users even, to go in and explore this data, figure out what's there, figure out if it's even worth further structuring. You know, is this a useful value, a useful metric here in the bronze layer before we put together an IT project to structure it and create reports and dashboards? You know, we, we might think like the, the number of windows on a house or what, whatever that metric is, is a useful number. You know, we might just send out, you know, a scouting party and say, well, is that really useful before we build a whole IT project and wait? So in terms of time to market, by, by having the, these layers of curation, you'll, you'll get there faster. 
you'll get, you'll get to the crux of it, the important stuff a lot faster because you're weeding out a lot of stuff that you probably don't need down here, way, way out here where, where your executives and, and your, your line folks are, are looking at this on a uh, hour by hour basis. That, I, you know, that, that's been my experience. It sounds like it lines up with yours as well. Quite uh, nice. Yeah, it seems like, you know, this is, we've got common approaches in the, even though we're on different sides of the country, common approaches in the SQL Server world. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, you know, as you can see, you can access all this data with SQL or Python or Scala. But, you know, because you can access it with SQL, you open it up to a broader audience within an enterprise. But you can get to it quickly and you don't have to wait for that long IT project and budgeting and, and justification before it gets into your reporting system, into your, say, your data warehouse. So you actually, in a way, get there faster because you have this, have this data lake and, and the flexibility of that. And Delta Lake makes doing this so, so much easier with the updates, the inserts, the merge into's, the copy into's. Rock on. Well, okay, let's continue on since we've got about, I'd say about 15, 20 minutes left. And so there'll okay, be time. For, well, so let's well, finish this up. And then we we will, we will do have a bunch of other questions. I'll be answering some of those questions online. So just in case we don't have time to answer them live. Uh, but I'll answer the questions in the Q&A panel while you go ahead and talk about the really awesome context of the change set here. Sure. So the change set, this comes from, imagine you get a, a load from a source system or a whole bunch of source systems. And these are changes that are going into your gold tables, into your dimensional model. You have this in your data warehouse, you have this in your OLTP system, but these are the updates. So you need to process this through the silver layer and, and standardize it. Um, and, and now you have a change set. Now you need to apply it to your dimension. Table. So I'm simulating one here. I am actually sampling some 10% of this customer dimension. And I'm saying that in, in my case, I'm changing the market segment from whatever it is to sports. Now you, you can make whatever, up whatever uh, business scenario where you would reclassify some of your customers from five segments to say six segments. But I'm, we're, we're adding a sixth segment to some 10% of our customers here. And you know, we're doing this for demo purposes, but there are real life scenarios where, where you're resegmenting your customers and using data science and machine learning for that. So that's, that's a change set. And then I go and evaluate it. You wanna make sure you have no duplicates in your change set. We're gonna display it. So out of some 700,000 records that ended up in the in the customer dimension, 10% uh, is 70K there. Um, and and here, here's the grand finale, you know, here's the here's the big big thing, the upsert or merge. So we're, we're, we, you know, we talked about what we're going to do. We're going to do a merge into, we're going to merge into the customer dimension, right? We're going to do a match on the customer key. Uh, you know, from our data set. Um, so to do that, we create a, a set. So here's our chain set in here. Now do, to do the SCD type two dimension, the, variate, the variant that we picked was between uh, the, the II and the III uh, type. But what we have to do is we select the chain set and we, we map the customer key as the merge key on this. And you can do this with multi-part keys and other things like that. And then we're gonna union that. We're gonna set map a null as the merge key. The first one is used for updates. The second one is used for inserts. Now by putting this all under the merge into, both of these, the update and insert or the upsert is done under one transaction at scale. You know, whether it's 750,000 records or, or 750 million records, you know, it's all done under one transaction thanks to Delta. So now what are we gonna merge on? Well, the customer key is that, you know, this update 
is that equal to the merge key? So when matched, and you can have additional qualifiers, when matched, and you have a current record, you know, is current equals one. And if none of the, oh, sorry. And if any of the attributes have changed, because if uh, your change set somehow, for some reason, doesn't have any changes reflected. So sometimes you'll get a load from a, a source system and there's absolutely no changes in there or 99% of those records that actually haven't changed. So that's what this clause is in for. Also, this clause is in here to make this, this running this item potent. So if I run this and then run it again, um, I, I don't want to you know, create unnecessary churn and add, add more records than I need to. So I'm adding this to make sure that it's item potent on there. Now, however, all right, so then you do your update, you set your is current to zero and you end date that record. So I've just done the update there, you know, and that's when match. So when your keys match, you, you do an update essentially. Now when not match, let's say you have a brand new record, right? Or, or you have a brand new record because you know, some of the attributes have changed, you do an insert. And we have this little shortcut here, insert star, which means you don't have to list out all the fields in the change set. You know, as long as your change set schema-wise matches your, um, your, your target table, you can just put the star in there. It makes things a lot easier. So you run that, and that's a lot of code to look through. And you know, I went through, and here you can see in the transaction log, all that's captured. And you know, operational statistics about what happened, that's all captured. I'm, you know, I I like to I like to test my code, so I left some of that in here. But you can see the quote unquote older original version. They're all is current, I had 700,000 of them. In the new version, about 70,000 of those um, have been indated. Um, in, in, the, in the quote unquote new version, 630,000 went untouched and, um, and, and about 70,000 were inserted. You know. And so those are all statistics. Do a final check of all current records. You know, we're just resegmenting the customer base, so you'd expect 700,000 there. And again, big data is tough, so, you know, visualizing it is important to tell the story. So I think this tells it better than, than my explanation the query. The, the, the original version or old version here in orange you can see it looks like our previous chart. Now I took 10% away from that original set and I created a new market segment, sports. So this delta or this, this difference here, basically I, I spilled it and, and poured it all into the sports segment. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. I mean, <clears throat> I think what you're doing here is absolutely providing that context. And then so related to that, right, you're noting the, the switch over to sports, right? That this segment is sports. And so that invariably leads me to ask a completely random question here, which is, what's your favorite sport? <laughs> well, uh, 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 Denny, as you know. It's not so random, uh, by uh, the way. <laughs> and and, and we, we recently discovered this, that we're both into rock climbing. That's right. <laughs> and, 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 and Denny's told me some amazing things about rock climbing around Seattle. And, and one of my favorite places out here in the east is Acadia Park, uh, climbing over to sea cliffs and whatnot. Uh, so, you know, what, once this COVID thing is, is, is over with, we hope to visit each other and, and, and go climbing outside. So, yeah, so yeah definitely. But, but what you're also saying is that based on this particular customer scenario, it's, it's very apparent that we should actually create a sports store maybe specializing in climbing. 
That's what you're Absolutely. saying. Absolutely. Okay, perfect. Absolutely. All right. I, I just want to make sure that we got that covered. That's all. So. And, and 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 let me let me show you. So you know the press home, the the as of aspect of what we created. Yeah. Is, I'm I'm doing a union all between two views. This first one, is like okay, I I set an arbitrarily large date here because I didn't want to update this every time the demo was given. But at some point in the future, you know, what does a market segment look like? Well, that's where you get the new or blue in here. And I, I want to union all that with some, some date in the past. So because we did this, we can do, a, a, you know, a quarter over quarter, week over week comparison. I'm doing kind of a, a you know, because of dates, uh, it's decades, but I, with this, I'm able to create a before and after view of the data that's now in my customer dimension, right? And so this is what you would normally do in, in a uh, uh, data warehouse, you know, and doing that dimensional analysis and, and doing that time-based uh, analysis. So, so this is this is a typical data warehouse query in here, and this is a visual. Now, with Delta Lake and time travel, you can see that I can look at transaction one that we showed a little bit before, and and I look at the original transaction, the load of the data, and um, and and I map that to old and new, and you get the same result. Does that make sense? So we can look at this two ways, verify the transaction. Now, as you run this daily or hourly or whatnot on into the future, you're ultimately going to vacuum this, this table and remove all those previous transactions, kind of clean it up. And so that's an administrative command. And, um, you know, and so it's best to use this this query here, the, the real data warehouse query in there. Now for a short period of time under that administrative period, you can certainly use this to understand what changed in say last night's load, right? You can see what happened. If you wanna know from an operational point of view, you can use the transaction log and the version numbers on it to understand. But for an analytics point of view, tell, tell your consumers to use the data warehouse query. Does that make sense? Absolutely. So actually, let me t chime in, Beth. There's actually a question which I'm in the halfway answering. So as uh, to call out that, Douglas is doing an awesome job calling out the fact that we have this ability to do dimensional modeling within data lakes because of Delta Lake, because Delta Lake has acid transactions, which is pretty sweet. But the key context is that, you know, we can do it, but obviously we're, we don't have all of the advantages of the enterprise data warehousing world in Delta Lake yet, but that's okay. So one of the things that we would definitely suggest to all of you is that go to the Delta Lake GitHub, create an issue. We, we as the Delta Lake community actively look at all the, uh, the, the requests coming in. So we can go ahead and understand better what you do or do not want to work with, right? And so if we're seeing a lot more people saying, hey, we love dimensional modeling, we really want uh, some of the features of dimensional modeling within Delta Lake, we get enough of the community that's saying, yes, that we want to do that. For that matter, you can even put some PRs in <laughs> to help us with that, right? So it's, a, it's an open source project. So that's what's great about this. So I just wanted to call that out real quick. Yeah. And yeah. Um... You know, coming from a Hadoop background, last eight years in helping customers optimize their spend on their data warehouse and actually move all the ETL out of their data warehouse and move it onto the data lake, doing it with Delta Lake and the merge and the transactions is so much simpler, so much easier and faster <laughs> um, as well. So, so with Delta Lake, you can, you can, or actually with Hadoop, you have to shut down access to your customer dimension, to your tables, while you're doing loads. With Delta Lake, you can leave those queries open to run because it's a commit and, and your users will always see a consistent view of the data. So again, overall, like coming from the Hadoop background, 
this is so much easier. And I know from, you know, ex Teradata colleagues that, you know, everything's not rosy in the data warehouse either. You have to kind of create staging tables and, and change views and, and, and things like that. So, but yeah, I it would, would be extremely excited to learn about what, what improvements we can make to Delta Lake technology and make it even easier to use by, by folks, especially folks coming from the data warehouse world that want to optimize their spend or scale up or they kind of want to avoid all the hops because, you know, this data, this 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 clean gold customer dimension. You're going to need it for reporting and dashboards. You're also going to need it for your AI and ML to do that because that's what's going to boost the next round of profits at enterprise is that AI and ML because that looks into the future. The dashboards and reporting looks backwards. You know, which is still important to do, but you know, the, the next wave of, of mega profits are going to come from looking into the future and anticipating you know what customers are going to do, how that's going to affect the sales orders and, and, and so on and so forth. Perfect. So uh, I believe we have time for about I'd say uh, about five to ten minutes worth of questions, Doug. Right. Great, so let's great. dive into that because we want. And so I, I answered a bunch of them online, but there's a bunch of that I have not yet had a chance to type because if I was, was typing right now, you'd hear my my mechanical keyboard clicking away and then nobody hear anything. So let's start. We got a great question. Uh, I'm pretty sure you have your perspective and I have my perspective. So let's make sure we both dive into this one because it's a great question. Is there a performance impact on using time travel compared to coding SCD2? on my own uh, on my own tape set of tables like this is similar to sql server temporal tables compared to manually maintained scd2 tables whoa um why, why don't you go first then you absolutely okay so you had, you had a minute or two to look at that. I, that's true i had a lot a little more time to actually look at this so fair enough so let me dive right into it so yes there actually is a potential performance impact because when what you're thinking about is that time travel is great for a short term like segment okay in other words uh like 30 days 90 days things of that nature and so when you're looking exactly as douglas's um remark here you definitely want to be able to use time travel because it's great for debugging. It's great to see market changes that happened recently, things of that nature, right? But what ends up happening is that, don't forget, time travel, what's going on underneath the covers, and we actually have a bunch of other YouTube uh, videos specifically on this, especially the one that says um, diving into Delta Lake, uh, unpacking the transaction log. What happens with time travel is that there basically is a duplication of all the records for all intents and purposes, okay? So every time there's a new version of data, there's a new set of data, okay, that's stored. It's, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but for all intents and purposes, the idea is there are more files underneath the covers. Because you have more files underneath the covers, you don't want time travel to be running too long because if it runs too long, you end up actually having far too many files, hence, the impact and performance, okay? So there are definitely some advantages to basic saying, eh, well, maybe I will physically go ahead and manually code the SED2 myself, okay? And it's not to say that you uh, don't want to use time travel. Like I said, the, for specific scenarios, time travel is absolutely a massively good idea. Where it, it, it comes in play is more like if you want SED2, uh, but you want to be able to look at the changes that happen to, let's just say, geographic information customers don't change geographies often but they will change over like a 10 year 20 year period right if i want to go back 20 years in time eh, you probably don't want to do that as a time travel trick you probably want to do this as a manual coding to scd2 so it really depends on your scenario and often i see customers where they'll do things slightly differently depending on the type of information because some of it's also very temporal in other words you need to look at history, but you only need to look at that history for a short period of time. Time travel is great for that versus, no, I need to look at this history for a very long period of time. Okay, SED2, coding it manually probably makes a lot more sense. So that, at least that's my context. Doug, go for it. I'm sure some of it you agree. Yeah, some of it you I, might even disagree, So, which I, is completely I, cool. I, I like it. I, I, like, I like what you said there a lot. So this is, yeah, so... In, in some ways, this is a shorter path. 
to to doing the query. Uh, with, with this, if you look at this query, we're looking at at the start date, end date across the whole table, uh, across the current version of the data. And, and we're looking at uh, both active and inactive. So all the changes that we reported in the customer dimension, we're looking at. And unless we've kind of Z ordered this on start date and end date, we're really, you know, data skipping helps, but we're really looking at all these dates, probably the whole table here. Um, and 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 we're we're doing that twice with with this type of query. Now we we may have some optimization to kick in here, but we're, we're basically looking at the whole table and all of its variants uh, twice in this query. If you look at this, what it should be doing on the cover is go to the delta log transaction table. Um, find the 0000.json that, that Denny mentioned that was covered in the previous uh, uh, tech chat, get the list of all those parquet files and then pull that back. And the same with this. So in, in a way we're, we're just scanning two versions of the table. Yeah, I, I guess actually, you know, as I talk to myself in this, this query here is really scanning version one of the entire table. This query here is scanning both versions of the table. So this is this is ultimately going to read twice as much data. Right. Yeah. So 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 that that's that's a one downside. So I I'd, I'd use this for more operational concerns, like like if. If you had a bad, if customers complaining that numbers are wrong and, then, and they're like, what happened last night on the load? Go look at this. You know, if, if you're doing a business analysis, your business users are going to probably want to look at this. Right. So, so uh, that, that's my thought. It, it's a very good question, you know, should, should you kind of, you know, use a, use uh, assembly code or, or the versions right? and 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 you know before before what we used to do or what some cus customers of mine used to do is they they look at using hbase to do these merges and and if if you remember the hbase no sequel it would simulate updates as well mm -hmm. but it, it also will keep additional versions of each value Again, that was that was sensitive to administrative commands wiping out the previous versions, but it was a nice trick to do updates. And you know, even though HBase generally had, uh, you know, because of what it was doing, maybe four times less I/O for a whole table scan. You know, for certain cases, it was faster. So again, it 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 depends. But you know, if if you're going at it more of a business question, you know, definitely use this. Take advantage of all the query optimizations available in, in Spark and, and, and Delta Lake as well. Um, if you're doing something operationally, um, yeah, definitely look at the versions. Cool. So, hey, we've got time probably for one or two more questions. So I'll, I'll, I'll ask, I'll provide a little context and then, uh, and then we time in with any color coding if you'd like as well, Doug. So uh, one question is how did to do the incremental load into Delta Lake? And so uh, we, this, the best way to answer, by the way, because I'm gonna give a short answer, but the best way to answer is actually look also into the, uh, our Databricks YouTube channel where we actually talk about uh, the, uh, the series is called Diving into Delta Lake. So we actually have a Diving into De Delta Lake, unpacking the transaction log, evolving the schema, involving uh, and enforcing the schema. And also we have um, DML internals or uh, how does updates, deletes, and merges work, okay? These will give you the technical context behind a lot of what Douglas has, uh, has been talking about today. But in addition to that, specific to the question about incremental load, all of them use the examples of incremental processing, a la structured streaming. So the idea of when you're processing data uh, and loading it into Delta Lake, the idea is that you can, even if it's not 
traditionally a streaming system. For example, it is a, a, a file that gets dropped in every few minutes or whatever else. You can then run st structure stream with a trigger once. That trigger once and allows you to go ahead and then still basically look for the file, stream it in, load it into Delta Lake anyways. And with all the asset transactions and all those other cool features that are in included. So that's the most typical uh, context of how you do incremental loads. Um, anything else that I, I may have missed, Douglas, that, that you'd like to call out? Yeah, those, those are great points. Um, you know, because because the uh, underlying engine has this unified API between batch and streaming, you you have the same functionality, the same experience in either way. And you can run SQL over those streaming Spark data frames as well. I, I'd like to add that um, I, I was working with a customer this this morning, and they were getting a dump from a data provider, and they were getting a dump of uh, essentially a, a business dimension table. And, and rather than overwrite everything, they want to figure out what changed from one month to another. And so, so there's a couple things to do there. One is to analyze it. You can do the minus operator to see what records have changed. When, when it comes to adding it to your, your, your copy of this business dimension table, you can use the merge operator, merge into table. You have your key, which is your primary key, which is going to be your key, you know, your, your business identifier, your start date and end date. Because again, they're sending you snapshots of their dimension table. But th they're, they're sending you full snapshots, full dumps. Um, what, billion rows multi-billion rows, right? Now, you don't want to necessarily reprocess all the billions of rows if, say, only 100,000 of those change. So you want to figure out what's different. Now, you can do a, you can use the merge into and then when not matched, you know, and you set the, set the primary key to be the, uh, you know, your matching key here would be your, your, your business identifier your start date and end date, right? And so when not matched, do an insert. Now you have just the changes that you've received, you know, changes based on matching on the primary key, which is awesome. And you can go back to this query with the version numbers and you can see exactly which records have changed. And then you can run, uh, you can update all your downstream analytics uh, that are based on that, that business dimension table and, and what might have changed. You know, if you need to rerun um, uh, your, your scores on the business, that, uh, I, but only on the businesses that have changed, then you can find out what that is through this query. You don't have to rerun another minus query and, and you get that. And, and now you can update the rest of your downstream pipeline with, with structured streaming and, and some other features that are coming out, that can kind of be all stitched together automatically. You know, that, that delta, you can write to a delta table, and you can have a stream reading off that delta table. It'll pick up only the changes. So, you, you, know, you, you know, on that, on that second hop there, you don't even have to run a query like this. Your, your, your structured streaming reading from Delta as a source will automatically pick up all those changes, which, you know, again, can greatly simplify your end-to-end -end pipeline, speed it up. Um, so some amazing, amazing things that, you know, stitching together these, these bits of, of technology are available. Perfect. So, hey, well, Time is up for us. We want to be cognizant of his time. We have a lot of other questions, so I apologize that we could not answer all of them. So I encourage you to go to the Databricks YouTube channel um, where this video is actually sitting right now. Because you're sitting there, then you're able to go ahead and uh, we actually do answer questions. So take your questions, uh, whether we already answered them or not, doesn't matter. Prop them right onto the YouTube channel. We'd love to go ahead and answer them live. So... Um, Thank you very much. I did want to wrap it up and send it back to Ryan. 
Great, thank you, Denny. Uh, well, thank you everyone for attending today. Uh, it was really exciting to, to hear Douglas share all his uh, knowledge on, on these uh, topics, as well as you know, Denny's great questions and, and sharing his own knowledge as well. But uh, if you wanna hear more, uh, feel free to, like, like Denny said, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Uh, and also don't forget to register for the Spark and AI Summit, uh, where they'll both be speaking. Uh, and there is a discount code for 25% off training uh, as part of the Spark AI Summit. So thanks very much and looking forward to the next session and all of your uh, fantastic questions and have a great rest of the week. Thanks have very much, everybody. Time. Have a good time. Climb on. Ha, <laughs> climb on. <laughs> <laughs>